Insurance fraud in the UK costs more than £1.2 billion a year. That's more than £3 million a day. Deliberate crashes, bogus personal injuries, even phantom pets. The fraudsters are risking more and more to make a quick killing, and every year it's adding more than £50 to your insurance bill. But insurers are fighting back exposing a fraudulent claim every five minutes. Armed with the latest fraud-busting technology, including covert surveillance systems, sophisticated data analysis techniques, and specially trained fraud investigators, they're catching these chances red-handed. Instead of getting away with it, more and more of these fraudsters are being caught out and claimed and shamed. Today on Claimed and Chained, a woman claiming £1.7 million after life-changing injuries left her unable to carry out the most basic tasks is caught on camera shopping for flat pack furniture. The claimant was seen going to a furniture store and packing furniture into the boot of a car. It's curtains for a claim riddled with fake injuries and stolen identities when the scammers can't get their stories straight. So in terms of occupancy, you said there were two of them in the car at the time? No, 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 no. Uh, three of them. Oh, so four of them then, OK. It can often be an indicator of fraud that the parties involved in the conspiracy can trip themselves up when they try and get into the minute details. And the footballer, after a payout for falling into a pothole, is shown the red card when it's revealed he'd suffered an identical injury on the pitch. The report of him playing football and being stretched off was critical in this case. That persuaded us that this was entirely a bogus claim. From career criminals to one-time chances, unscrupulous individuals will go to great lengths to come up with elaborate fibs and tell tall tales in order to put in bogus claims. But today on Claimed and Shamed, we'll see how quick-witted lawyers and insurance investigators have the tools to expose the scammers' lies so they can get to the truth of the matter. Our first case today started with a collision that was so serious that the emergency services had to be called. For one of those involved, the consequences were severe. The woman had been left with a traumatic brain injury and other associated injuries. She put a claim into RSA, the insurer of the driver of the car which caused the crash, for the effect the injuries had had on her everyday life. The injuries were described as significant, from fatigue, vertigo, dizziness, right through to post-traumatic stress disorder, not being able to sleep, not being able to watch TV, not being able to drive, not being able to carry out her hobbies, including playing tennis, walking. The woman was also asking for compensation for loss of earnings, saying she could no longer carry out her role as a teaching assistant. And that wasn't all. This claimant also suggested that there were other impacts, not just to herself, but to her wider responsibilities. So her family, caring for her children, also needing to live in alternative accommodation, and also not being able to carry out basic tasks, such as DIY, looking after the property, and so as time went on, the actual costs associated to this claim were increasing significantly. There was no doubt the woman had been involved in a nasty accident, but Adele had concerns that the losses she was claiming for kept escalating. It's really important for us that we meet claims from honest customers, but we have to be careful that claims are not being exaggerated. And in this particular case, as time went on, there were more and more losses added to the claim, more and more incidentals, more and more loss of earnings, loss of payment, future care. When the losses were totted up, the total was sky high. The value of the claim was stated as £1.7 million. Faced with such a huge payout, it was imperative that Adele and her team carefully validated the woman's claim. Their suspicions about the steep rise in the value of the claim led them to step up their investigative techniques. 
and we appointed a surveillance um, operative to make sure that the person actually was suffering the injuries and the, I suppose, uh, limitations that were claimed for as part of this incident. It's really important when we're trying to get an accurate picture of people that we actually are able to see what is happening to that individual. And over a period of time, that's how you have to get an accurate picture of somebody's life. The investigators carried out 28 days of surveillance across a period of nearly three years. What their cameras captured about the woman's day-to-day -day life was in stark contrast with her claims of debilitating injuries. On one occasion, the claimant was due to attend an appointment for an assessment in relation to the claim. That assessment was cancelled at short notice and the claimant was seen going to a furniture store and packing furniture into the boot of a car. This grossly contradicted the woman's claim that she had difficulties lifting things and even walking. And this footage was just the tip of the iceberg. What we witnessed was the individual being able to drive freely, be able to pick up medical equipment, walking up hills, looking after other members of her family, in particular her grandchildren, and ultimately be able to get involved in her own hobbies. On 27 out of the 28 days the woman was covertly filmed, she was seen getting on with her life, seemingly unhampered by the difficulties she had claimed to experts she was suffering with. And on the only day her injuries were apparent, she had a key appointment to attend. I think what's really important about this claim to know is there was only one instance of the period of time that this individual was surveilled that the injuries that had been claimed for were demonstrated. And that just so happened to be on the day that the claimant visited her solicitor. Every other piece of surveillance footage showed that the individual did not have any of the injuries that they had claimed for. On top of this damning footage, the investigators also uncovered social media posts that showed the woman taking part in activities, such as sewing, that she had claimed she could no longer enjoy because of her injuries. Consequently, Adele wasn't willing to entertain the idea of settling this case for £1.7 million. By the time the case got to court and the woman had seen all the evidence Adele and her team had amassed against her, she dropped the value of her claim, but she still wanted to pursue the legal case. She decided to change the schedule of losses and reduce the amount of the claim. Nearly 10 years after the road traffic accident, the woman's case was heard at Cambridge County Court. Alongside the surveillance and social media evidence, the court was also presented with a medical questionnaire filled by a family member which contradicted what paramedics had reported at the scene. This was the only evidence that there was potentially some unconsciousness as a result of the accident. However, the ambulance report contradicts that and says there was no lack of consciousness at the time of the incident. The trial went on for nine days before a verdict was reached. The judge concluded that the physical and psychological impairments that were part of this claim were in fact either exaggerated or fabricated and that the surveillance evidence clearly demonstrated that. The judge found the claimant to be fundamentally dishonest. Instead of the £1.7 million she'd been hoping to benefit from, the woman's claim was declined and she was added to the insurance fraud register, which could impact her ability to take out insurance or other financial products in the future. Adele reminds those trying to get away with a false claim that the investigators have the know-how to get to the bottom of what's really going on. It's really important that insurance claimants understand they need to be honest and genuine when reporting their losses to us. As insurance companies, we will validate the claim and we will follow up with the use of investigation technologies. Later, things that go bump in the night. It's lights off for a prisoner who said he'd fallen out of a bunk bed when his story doesn't add up. The prisoner didn't actually report this to healthcare staff until four days after the accident took place and didn't seek any medical attention until that point either.
Claims for whiplash injuries have long been a headache for fraud investigators. These soft tissue injuries can be very painful, when genuine, but are also relatively easy to feign, which has opened the door to some fraudsters lying so they can put in a fake claim. However, all of that has been stopped with reforms, which mean that anyone now wanting to claim for this injury has to provide medical evidence, and the amount of money they can claim is also more tightly regulated. But just before these changes came into force, a group of chancers took the opportunity to put in some very spurious claims. This whiplash incident was the result of a prang at a set of traffic lights. An LV customer reported he'd driven his Vauxhall into the back of a Mercedes. Ewan Brown is the linked and organised crime controller for the company. He described a lapse of judgement approaching traffic lights when his Vauxhall Vectra had gone into the rear of a Mercedes A-Class in front. He explained that he'd had some sort of light damage to the front of the Vauxhall and he wouldn't have to claim for that through ourselves because he'd managed to fix it himself. It seemed to have been a very minor collision, but as LV's customer had admitted the accident was his fault, the company contacted the other driver to offer assistance to her and the three female passengers the Vauxhall driver says he'd seen in the car at the time. But she didn't seem to want any help. In that first contact our claims department made with the Mercedes driver, she did appear hesitant and eager to get off the phone. She explained she was out and about with her mother at the time and suggested she would call us back at a later date. In her haste to terminate the call, the Merc driver ended up dropping a bit of a clangor, which planted doubts in Ewan's mind. She told us that there was only two passengers in the Mercedes when the accident happened. So we now had a situation where, in one phone call, the driver of the Vauxhall had told us that the Mercedes had three passengers, and in another phone call, the driver of the Mercedes had said that she had two passengers. Um, that immediately rose suspicions. The inconsistencies had begun. The woman called back the insurer later that day, but her response to the offer to repair the Mercedes was unexpected. Are you looking for us to sort the repairs out to your vehicle? No, no. Um, can you talk to my brother? Just because yeah. like, he knows more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She asked that we speak to someone else um, who she introduced as her brother. And, and that was an interesting development. The car's already been repaired. It should be done over the next couple of days. OK. This guy seemed quite self-assured and, and he certainly seemed to know a lot about how an insurance claim would operate. So we felt this wasn't the first time that this person had um, been involved in an insurance claim. The so-called brother then went on to say that a solicitor had already been instructed because all the occupants of the car had sustained personal injuries. Again, there was confusion about how many passengers had been travelling in the Mercedes. So in terms of occupancy, there was two, you said there was, two, there was two of them in the car at the time? No, 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 there was uh, three of them. Oh, so there's four, uh, okay, so there's four of them then, okay. The brother's version of events was the same as the Vauxhall driver's, but didn't tally with his sister's, the Mercedes driver. The men said there were three passengers in the car, but she said there were just two. For Ewan, this was a worrying development. It can often be an indicator of fraud on a suspected staged incident that the parties involved in the conspiracy can trip themselves up when they try and get into the minute details when they're trying to recall to an insurer the circumstances of something that's never happened. In the face of this evidence, Ewan suspected he was dealing with an organised scam and that this so-called brother had recruited both drivers to perpetrate a con. Our belief is that the individual on that phone is a professional enabler that had likely recruited our own customer, the Vauxhall driver, and the Mercedes driver, and convinced them to stage an accident for monetary gain. A few days later, the insurer received claim notification forms from the driver and her three passengers, who said they were in the Mercedes. This is despite the fact that the driver had previously said she only had two passengers. All four occupants of the Mercedes presented 
personal injury claims for neck, shoulder, back, soft tissue injuries, what we'd call a whiplash injury. And this was shaping up to be an expensive case. The value of the claims being pursued by the occupants of the Mercedes would have equated to around £21,000. This figure also included more than £2,000 worth of repairs to the back of the Mercedes, which also didn't make sense, as the Vauxhall driver had said there'd been minimal damage to his car. The Merck driver was also claiming for storage and recovery costs and had supplied an invoice to back this up. Concerns about this case increased when close examination of this paperwork revealed the date on it had been changed with a pen. A six for June had been turned into a five for the month of May. The investigators were pretty sure they knew why this had been done. We had been told that this accident happened on the 30th of May. Now, that date is quite a significant date in terms of the insurance world because the 31st of May, the very next day, was the implementation date for the whiplash reform. What this meant for this claim and other claims was that individuals that were involved in a car crash that resulted in them sustaining a personal injury would be entitled to a lot less money than before. Um, so we were concerned that this was a conspiracy to backdate the date that those vehicles collided with one another for monetary gain. The case was escalated to the Claims Crime Prevention Team, which discovered that the Vauxhall driver, the LV customer, had a black box fitted to his car that would have recorded valuable data, known as telematics, about where and when the vehicle had been on the day of the incident, and whether it had even been involved in an accident. And the findings blew this claim out of the water. We were astonished by what they told us. Um, our investigator first looked at the alleged date of accident on the 30th of May and could find no crash incident reports on that date, nor could he find any geo coordinates to suggest our Vauxhall was at the junction with the traffic lights that the customer had reported to us. If the two cars hadn't collided at the traffic lights, how had they become damaged? The investigators turned back to the telematics data to look for a possible answer. They then did identify a different date with a crash incident report a couple of weeks later. The actual collision that the Vauxhall had been involved in actually took place in an isolated car park, nowhere near the traffic lights the customer had told us about, and certainly not on the date the customer had told us about. And then it got really interesting when we looked further down the reports. The next day after the crash incident report, we did see that the customer's Vauxhall had visited the home address of the Mercedes. Which suggested the two drivers knew each other. The investigators now had a theory about what had really gone on. We believed that this was a premeditated conspiracy and that the cars had been purposefully crashed into one another to obtain money from us by deception. We made a decision that this warranted a criminal investigation so the case was referred to the Insurance Fraud Enforcement Department at the City of London Police. Police detectives established that there hadn't been any passengers at all in the Mercedes when the two cars had been deliberately crashed together. They also discovered that the three supposed passengers didn't even know their details had been used and were all victims of identity theft. The police suspected the so-called brother had used their identities in an attempt to scam more money. The driver of the Vauxhall was arrested and taken into police custody. The driver of the Vauxhall did make a full and frank admission to the detective at the police that he had fabricated the accident and he did explain that he had been offered a monetary award by a professional enabler and had accepted £500 for his involvement in the scam. He received a police caution for the offence of fraud by false representation had his fingerprints and mugshot taken and was added to the police national convictions record. His name was also uploaded to the insurance fraud register. The Mercedes driver's claim was rejected and she also attended a police interview and was loaded to the insurance fraud register. As for her so-called brother, the professional enabler, all the information gathered about him by the police and the insurer was sent to the insurance fraud bureau. That 
evidence and intelligence will now be developed further and there's every chance that that individual will get a knock on the door from the law very soon. When unscrupulous individuals commit fraud against the big insurance companies, it pushes up all our premiums. But some scammers target their local authority instead, lying to try to get them to pay out on a dodgy claim. With public budgets tight and resources currently under tremendous pressure, councils can ill afford to pay out on claims based on a fib when that money should be contributing to essential services like local libraries and social care. Lawyer Chris Booth is head of insurance at Forbes Solicitors. Among his clients are local authorities, and one of them got in touch to ask him to investigate after receiving a dubious claim from a jogger. In recent years, with the advent of weekly park runs and the popularity of the NHS's Couch to 5K programme, millions of us Brits have donned our trainers and hit the tarmac, just like the man in our next case. This claim centred around a guy in his 30s. The claimant claimed that he was out jogging one evening during summer. Uh, his uh, left foot went into a pothole uh, in, in the pavement. He tripped and fell. This incident had occurred between 7.30pm and 8pm on a day in August. The jogger was seeking a payout as he'd injured his Achilles tendon. He was claiming damages for his injuries, which we'd assessed at around £10,000. No other losses were claimed. The fact that the jogger was only asking for money for his injuries perplexed Chris. The claimant was uh, a self-employed builder uh, and claimed that as a result of his injuries, he couldn't work. Inevitably, one would have expected uh, a claim for lost earnings because he couldn't work, he couldn't earn. Uh, but no claim was presented, which we did think was very, very strange. This wasn't the only thing that seemed off with the builder's claim. The local council had involved Forbes early on because it had noticed a number of other worrying inconsistencies with his story. The pothole in question, which, which he claimed caused him to fall, was very close to a wall, uh, and in fact there was a hedge overgrowing onto the footway and it would have been all but impossible for him to have encountered that uh, pothole with his left foot, as he claimed. And there was more. Another factor that prompted our clients to ask us to investigate this claim was that one of the claimant's close friends had also had a, an accident in, in similar circumstances, and, and red flags such as this can't be ignored, and that just uh, suggest that the claim needs to be given extra scrutiny. Chris and his team started by examining the jogger's medical records. Just like his version of events, they also contained an inconsistency. One of his medical records suggested that he'd fallen in the road. Uh, a different set of records, uh, he explained that he'd fallen on a footpath. The jogger couldn't keep his story straight. But whilst he changed the circumstances of the accident when talking to medical experts, there was one significant detail he'd failed to mention to any doctor. The medical report and the medical records had a total absence of any explanation as to how the accident occurred. It simply said that he'd suffered this injury without explaining that it had been caused in a pothole injury. There was one thing that he had mentioned to the experts, though that provided a new line of inquiry for Chris's eagle-eyed investigators. His love of playing football. One of my team is also a keen footballer and spotted the fact that the injury was one that is commonly found when playing football. As a result of that, we uh, undertook some investigations into local football teams. Searching for any footballers who might have injured their Achilles tendon at the time of the alleged incident, Chris and his team came across a match report that proved to be very revealing. Two days after the alleged accident date, there was a media report uploaded which showed that the claimant had been playing in a football match on the day of the alleged accident. He'd been stretched off with an identical injury uh, as that which he claimed had been caused in 
the pothole trip, which was the Achilles tendon injury. So, on the very same day the jogger had claimed he'd injured his tendon in the evening by tripping on a pothole, the investigators now had proof that he'd hurt the same ankle earlier in the day, playing football. Chris could only draw one conclusion from this discovery. We were in no doubt whatsoever that he hadn't tripped in a pothole, he'd simply suffered the injury whilst playing football and was trying to uh, fabricate a claim on the back of that. The investigators had hit the jackpot with this information. The report of him playing football and being stretched off was critical in this case. That was the key piece of evidence that persuaded us that this was entirely a bogus claim. In light of the evidence they'd uncovered, the outcome of this case was a no-brainer for Chris and his client, the local authority. It rejected the jogger's claim and refused to pay him a single penny in damages. We set out our position to the claimant uh, concisely and explained to him what evidence we were going to put before the court. Uh, once he saw the evidence we had against him, he dropped the claim immediately. But it was too late for the jogger to back out. Ordinarily, when a claim is discontinued, that's the end of it. But my clients felt very strongly about this case, so they took the unusual step to take the fight to him. Nearly two years after the jogger said he'd been injured by a council pothole, he found himself at Durham County Court, where the judge, unconvinced by his story, dismissed his claim and found him fundamentally dishonest. Following the fundamental dishonesty finding, the court ordered the claimant to pay the council's legal costs, which were assessed at a little over £11,500. Faking the claim had backfired for this man. Instead of walking away with a £10,000 settlement, he ended up having to pay more than that to the local council. Pursuing this case through the court system meant that the council's funds had been protected. Bogus claims are a big problem for local authorities. The reason my client was very keen to obtain this fundamental dishonesty finding is that without that, they couldn't reclaim their costs from the claimant, and they felt it was important that the public purse was not out of pocket for defending a fraudulent claim. Still to come, the yoga instructor whose social media exposed how she'd stretched reality and bent the truth about the extent of her injuries. She had posted pictures following the road traffic accident of her doing handstands, of her appearing to do roly polies, and doing other yoga stands. There are 142 prisons in the UK, housing almost 90,000 people. So it's not uncommon for their litigation teams to receive claims from those serving time. If an accident happens inside and the prisoner thinks it's the authority's fault, they can approach a personal injury lawyer and bring a claim, with any resulting payout being made from public funds. But whenever there is a pot of money available, there are always chances willing to tell a whopper to try to play the system. This next case happened at HMP Manchester, a high security prison which used to be known as Strangeways. Sarah McCracken deals with any legal claims made by inmates and was tasked with this next one. The prisoner was claiming that he'd fallen out of his bed during the night due to a loose guardrail on the bunk bed. He was fast asleep on the top bunk when he rolled over and fell to the floor. The prisoner claimed that his injuries were pain to his jaw and cheek and dizziness. The prisoner waited three months before claiming compensation for the injuries. The total value being claimed was £7,300. That was £2,300 for damages and £5,000 for costs. In terms of damages, that would be an average amount for bunk bed related injuries. The man was blaming the prison for the fall because he said the bunk rail, there to stop prisoners falling out of the top bunk, was faulty. He said he'd reported it twice, but that nothing was done about it. He also claimed he'd done the right thing by reporting the incident to prison officers on his wing. 
The prisoner alleged that he had spoken to staff over the intercom that evening and he stated that the staff had told him to report it again in the morning. Sarah needed to check out his claims and, as all complaints and injuries have to be documented, she turned to the paperwork where reports of falls and injuries are recorded. Typically, the investigation will start with any accident paperwork, any entries made in the observation book, any entries made by staff in the prisoner case notes. But despite the prisoner's insistence that he had reported the fall, there was no record of it. This was puzzling to Sarah, as the accident should have been logged under prison rules. Giving the claimant the benefit of the doubt, she approached the staff working on his wing, in person. The two staff were asked for their recollections and neither staff could recall speaking to that prisoner at that particular time. Having drawn a blank on the wing, the next step for Sarah was to check with the healthcare staff on site. Surely, if he'd been badly injured, the prisoner would have needed treatment. Ordinarily, if a prisoner does suffer any kind of injuries uh, while he's in prison, it's quite quick to report these injuries to staff and expect follow-up healthcare treatment. And finally, a record of the fall. The prisoner had been to see medical staff, but he'd taken his time. The prisoner didn't actually report this to healthcare staff until four days after the accident took place and didn't seek any medical attention until that point either. Considering he was supposed to have fallen four feet from a top bunk, he got off lightly. At the time the healthcare staff saw the prisoner, they recorded some slight bruising. You would expect to find more soft tissue damage, maybe cuts and bruises around the body, but there was no evidence of that on this prisoner. Now convinced that the man was just in it for the money, Sarah started to look for other inconsistencies, starting with the fact that the prisoner had chosen to sleep on the top bunk, even though, according to him, he'd already reported a problem with the safety rail. At the time of the accident, the prisoner was in a single occupancy cell. He wasn't sharing with anybody else. There was a bunk bed in there, but he did have the choice of top or bottom bunk. He chose to sleep on the top, despite the fact that he knew that the guardrail was faulty. By now, Sarah was doubtful whether the guardrail had even been faulty in the first place, as she could find no record of that complaint either. Neither were there any complaints from other prisoners who'd occupied the cell before him. Had a report been made, Sarah says it would have been fixed. We obviously take prisoner safety extremely seriously, and that goes with bunk beds as well. We do have guardrails fitted to make sure that prisoners can't fall out of beds. These do come loose over time or are sometimes damaged by prisoners, but there's also a maintenance program that covers this and they cover the repairs. So when rails are reported by staff, they are repaired quite quickly. Staff will go in and check these on a daily basis and prisoners always know that they can speak to staff and report issues with the cells. There was no evidence that this accident had even happened, so Sarah pushed back. We took that information back to the other side, um, denied liability and um, they discontinued their claim. Sarah was surprised when the prisoner's solicitors didn't want to contest the case. In bunk bed claims, it is quite unusual to get this kind of formal withdrawal from the solicitors, just because it's not uncommon for these types of claims to be around, for guardrails to be faulty and for prisoners to then allege that they have fallen out of bed. But I think based on the fact that there was absolutely no evidence available, they must have taken it that that was quite detrimental to their case. Careful scrutiny of claims made by prisoners means public money is protected. It's always important to investigate these matters properly and accurately to avoid payouts on potentially fraudulent claims because ultimately this money comes out of the taxpayer's purse. Warrior, tree pose, downward facing dog. Tens of thousands of us Brits practice our favourite yoga moves every week. But the yoga instructor in our next case got herself in a heap of trouble after she fibbed and said she could no longer do her usual poses after her car collided with a tractor. David Phillips works in the investigations department of NFU Mutual. He was asked to look at a case following a genuine accident caused by a policyholder 
a farmer. In June 2016, we received a notification of a road traffic accident from our policy holder. They were driving a tractor down a narrow country road and they believed they'd been in a collision or a glance blow with a vehicle that, that they were passing. The farmer told his insurers that the damage he'd caused to the car had been, in his words, fairly light. Following the accident, both vehicles had stopped. Our driver and the third-party driver exchanged details. During that time, the other driver then approached our policyholder direct and claimed £450 for the damage to a vehicle. Um, it appears that our policyholder paid that out in good faith and we thought no more of it. Having made an informal payment without involving the insurance company, the matter should have been done and dusted. But in fact, it was far from over. Around a month later, a letter from the car driver's lawyer landed. We received a claims notification form via her solicitors, alleging that there was damage to her vehicle, which we knew about, but also she was claiming um, 18 days loss of earnings and significant personal injury from soft tissue injuries, dizziness, trauma uh, and, and fear of driving. The woman was a yoga instructor and these injuries meant she couldn't teach. She was also having difficulty with simple tasks such as bathing. So she wanted a payout for loss of earnings and for the care she required. And there was more. Even though the farmer had already paid her £450 for the damage to her car, she was now saying she needed much more than that to fix it. They were claiming that the third party's injury were worth about £5,600. The vehicle damage was now valued at £1,500. She was claiming almost £1,200 for loss of earnings, uh, almost £1,200 for care, and uh, a few hundred pounds for other expenses. So now the third party's claim was approaching nearly £10,000. Um, on top of that would be her legal costs as well. David felt this hefty claim was totally out of proportion with the circumstances of the accident. When we first viewed the vehicle damage, we thought this was a very low velocity speed impact, a very small scrape down the side of the vehicle. We did not expect to receive uh, such large injury claim, if at all. This claim wasn't making sense, so David and his team got started on their routine checks, which included looking at the yoga teacher's social media profile to see how her injuries might be reflected in what she was posting. There was no mention of them. We looked at her web pages online where she posted details of her business. During the time that she claimed to be off work, she had yoga classes running and her classes had not actually been closed down as she had alleged. And whilst supposedly recuperating from the accident, she hadn't only been flexing in the yoga studio, she'd also been showing off her talents in the great outdoors. The social media posts showed that she was able to carry out various poses and yoga uh, stances that she perhaps said she couldn't. She had posted pictures which appeared to be, whilst she was on holiday following the road traffic accident, of her doing handstands, of her appearing to do roly-polies, and doing other yoga stands on beaches uh, of the south coast of England which didn't actually match up to the claim that she was presenting to us. David was puzzled that the yoga teacher had shared so much online whilst, at the same time, fighting for a payout for her injuries. We're often surprised at how flagrant people are about their social media life and how much they do post on there when it is clearly at odds with what is being claimed by them from an insurance company. David's team approached the yoga teacher's solicitor for an explanation for these online photographs. The driver alleged that they were taken sometime well before the road traffic accident and it was just a pure coincidence they posted them whilst they were on holiday following the road traffic collision. David and his team wanted proof that they'd been taken before the collision and asked for the original photos. This would allow them to examine the metadata which would determine exactly when these photos had been taken. But it wasn't to be. The third party refused to provide us the evidence that we sought and denied, continued to deny, that the photographs were taken 
following the road traffic accident, um, they maintain their story that they've been taken before the road traffic accident and posted at the same time as a holiday. It was a stalemate between the insurers and the claimant. In the meantime, David had been busy chasing up other lines of inquiry, including the yoga teacher's medical records, which were inconclusive. While she had been to seek medical attention following the road traffic accident, it was not clear whether this actually related to the road traffic accident or for other medical conditions. It certainly called into question the validity of her claim and her injuries. Considering the long list of ailments she was claiming for, it seemed unlikely that following the accident, the yoga instructor wouldn't have seen a doctor specifically about her crash injuries. David and his team had seen enough. This lack of information in her medical records, plus the social media evidence, meant there would be no payout. They wrote to the claimant's solicitors outlining all their concerns and asked whether they still wanted to pursue the matter. We then found that the third-party solicitor was no longer acting for the third-party driver. They had come off record and she was now pursuing the claim on her own. Forging ahead, the yoga teacher started court proceedings, a move she may have later come to regret. The judge questioned the inconsistencies in her medical report and the judge felt that the social media posts on the balance of probabilities had been posted while she was on holiday and did not support that she was injured during and post road traffic accident. The judge summed up and found the third party driver to be fundamentally dishonest. The judge also said that the claimant had to also repay our legal costs in defending the claim, which amounted to some £20,000. On top of this hefty penalty, the yoga teacher was also placed on the insurance fraud register, which will make it difficult for her to obtain insurance in the future. Though satisfied with the outcome of the case, David would have preferred not to have received it at all. Insurance fraud isn't a victimless crime. Behind every claim, there is a policyholder who is brought into litigation. The insurance companies, and NFU Mutual is no different, would prefer to be spending our time settling genuine claims rather than having to investigate suspicious and fraudulent claims. Another shocking case of deception and a timely reminder that we all need to remain vigilant to the scourge of insurance fraud. From chances exaggerating injury to criminal gangs engineering crashes for cash, these tricksters hit us all in the pocket. Every year, insurers lose millions to these scams and it's you, the policyholder, who ends up paying the price in hikes to your premiums. But the sheer number of thieves caught in the act sends a clear message to anyone thinking about cheating the system. They claimed, but now they're shamed.